James Lyons was born in 1735 to Zophar and Mary Lyon. Zophar died when James was only nine years old, and despite this happening at an early age, James was able to go to the College of New Jersey, Princeton University, and he was able to obtain a master's degree while he was there. It was during this time in James' life that he became very interested in music, writing hymns and writing songs and, and the music for songs. And he became the first published composer to print music in the United States of America. He graduated from Princeton in 1759 and published the musical book that was titled Uriah at about this time. And one of the songs that he wrote the music for later became a very well-known song that many have likely heard of. Uh, the title of that song was My Country Tis of Thee. And another minister in Massachusetts took Reverend Lyon's music and added the words for that song, and that's how My Country Tis of Thee came to be. Another well-known song that James Lyon wrote is The Lord Cometh. It's a very popular hymn that's still used to this day. He became licensed to preach in New Brunswick in 1762 and was officially ordained in New Brunswick in 1764. In 1766, he was living in Onslow Township and by 1768, he was living in Pictou, Nova Scotia. And it was while he was there in Nova Scotia that the English gave him a land grant uh, to help offset his ministerial salary. And he became associated with the Philadelphia Land Grant Company that had acquired a tremendous amount of land in that Pictou, <coughs> Nova Scotia area. And he was able to obtain several land grants in the region to the extent where the church actually took him aside and warned him that it could look bad if he was appearing to be a land grabber or speculator and also trying to minister to the people. So they warned him not to allow that to become a, a conflict that would hinder his ministry. <clears throat> the church was unable to fulfill the salary contract that he had with them and the people in the area were becoming concerned as, as well as Reverend Lyon was becoming concerned that they were being forced to swear allegiance to the King of England and James ended up leaving Nova Scotia and he left behind a large number of people that he felt were as hungry for liberty and freedom as many of the people in New England were. <clears throat> he arrived in Boston and the timing could not have been any better. It was a time when Mr. Jones from Machias happened to be there and Machias had just received word from the Massachusetts government that they were going to honor them as a full-fledged township, but they had about six criteria that they had to meet in order to become a, an official township. And a few of those things revolved around having a minister. They had to have a minister of the gospel, and they had to have a meeting house for church services. It was on the list of requirements. So with Reverend Lyons having just left Nova Scotia, possibly looking for another place to minister, and Mr. Jones being in Boston at the same time, he said, hey, why don't you come to Machias? 
be our minister. Um, so he did on a temporary basis, and he liked it. He was very well received. The people here in Machias liked him. And in 1771, he became the full-time minister, first ever in Machias. And he stayed here for many, many years afterwards. When he moved to Machias, he brought with him a black servant named London Addis. And at the time, London would have only been about 12 or 13 years old. <clears throat> at this time in American history, black servants were considered personal property. It appears likely that James Lyon inherited London Addis and that London's parents probably were owned by the Lyon family. Later, Reverend Lyon was able to free London of the ownership that they had and London actually met a white woman in Machias named Eunice Foss from a very prominent family and after a couple of years the people of Machias actually encouraged them to get married and they started a black settlement just on the outskirts of town just upriver from the built up portion of the village at West Falls um, and that black settlement became known as Addisville, likely named after London and Eunice Addis. <clears throat> they had many children, and there were multiple families living there at Addisville. It's interesting that after the war, London received a military pension for his service during the Revolutionary War. Some have argued that slaves may not have had a choice in the matter if their master told them they were going to fight in the war, that they um, had no choice and it may not appear as patriotic if you were forced to fight for the American cause, but London Addis did fight for the American cause and was rewarded afterwards with the military pension. After the war, London actually started some sort of shipping business and was able to ship lumber from Machias to various ports along the East Coast, lumber and firewood as well. So back to Reverend Lyon. He was very patriotic. He supported the rebel cause. He became the chaplain of the militia in Machias and was actually the chairman of the Machias Committee of Safety. Many towns had a, a committee of safety and Machias did as well. And it was the defensive militia security for the towns. Uh, Machias was very remote and that was kind of their military sheriff combined resources was this Machias Committee of Safety. Reverend James Lyon wrote several letters to some pretty high-ranking people in the early American government, including George Washington. They had some correspondence back and forth during the early years of the American Revolution. He also wrote letters to Continental Congress. And here's a few words from one letter that he wrote. We must now inform your honors that the inhabitants of this place exceed 100 families, some of which are very numerous, and that divine providence has cut off all our usual resources. A severe drought last fall prevented our laying in sufficient stores and had no vessels visit us this winter. We must have suffered nor we this spring able to procure provisions sufficient for carrying on our business. We must add, we have no country behind us to lean upon, nor can we make escape by fight. The wilderness is impervious and vessels we have none. To you, therefore, honored gentlemen, we humbly apply for relief. 
You are our last, our only resource. We cannot take a denial, for, under God, you are all our dependence, and if you neglect us, we are ruined. Those are a few words from a letter that he wrote to the Continental Congress. People were literally starving. And Reverend Lyon wrote to Continental Congress begging them for support and basically said, you are our only hope of survival. Before Continental Congress could respond, the ships with goods that were captained by Ichabod Jones, accompanied by the armed British ship, the, His Majesty's ship Margareta, came to Machias. And there was a conflict. They didn't want their lumber going back to Boston to build barracks for British soldiers. The people here in Machias were leaning heavily on the patriotic side and did not want to support the British any longer. It was decided they needed to capture the captain of the Margareta, Midshipman Moore. They wanted to do it with as little and if possible no bloodshed. So the idea was planned that during the church service on Sunday, they would capture more. It's not clear if, it, if their intention was to capture them immediately during the service or as soon as the service concluded, but um, Reverend Lyon was part of the plan. And the plan failed largely in part because nobody told London Addis about the plan. At this time, London would have been about 16 years old, and word had been sent to Pleasant River, Chandler River, that, hey, we're going to need help here in Machias. We've got a plan, and we're going to take on the British Navy, essentially, and it's all hands on deck. We'll take all the help that we can get. So they knew help was coming mid-morning on Sunday. London Addis, the black servant, had no idea that this was going to take place. It was a typical June morning, warm. They had the windows open in the church. London, like any 16-year-old boy, might be daydreaming a little during the church service, looked out the window and saw men coming across the river in boats and barges, armed with pitchforks, scythes, axes, muskets, and his immediate reaction was to burst out that the town's being invaded. Well, Midshipman Moore, the British captain, was smart enough to realize that these men weren't coming for the people in the church, they were coming for him. His quickest escape was to jump out the window of the church. And he jumped out of the window, ran down over the hill, got in a rowboat, and was rowed to the safety of the Margareta. The men out of the church chased him, fired shots at the British ship, and the British fired back with some swivel guns. No real damage was done. The following day, the Margareta attempted to escape Machias Bay, and the Machias Committee of Safety boarded the Unity and the Falmouth packet and chased after the Margareta and were able to catch up with the Margareta because the boom on the Margareta had broken and the Machias Committee of Safety was able to capture the Margareta and the crew that was on board. And this would be the first naval battle of the American Revolution. Christmas Day, December 25th, 1775, Reverend Lyon wrote a letter to George Washington, and we know it's not the first time that they have corresponded through written letters. And it's interesting in this letter that Reverend Lyon has knowledge of military maneuvers taking place in Quebec. 
he is encouraging George Washington in this letter to support the capture of Nova Scotia and he gives details of why he thinks it could be a success and, and how that it should be done. After the war, Reverend Lyon learned that the U.S. Canadian border was being proposed to be 100 miles below Machias, so that Machias would have been within Canada, and he was going to have no part of it. He felt the people of Machias had fought too hard for their independence and freedom, and, and they wanted to be part of the United States. And he protested and contributed to moving the border further north so that Machias did remain within the United States. Reverend James Lyon died in 1794. He was still living in Machias at the time. And we find it interesting that at the time, people would list pretty much every belonging they had in their will. And despite his musical success and gifts and abilities, there's no mention in his will of any of his musical writings or any musical instruments. The Congregational Church here in Machias has a memorial stained glass window in it and the, that window is still there today. And the inscription on that window says, Reverend James Lyon, a noble patriot, a faithful minister, a good man, and full of the Holy Ghost. Reverend Lyon set up a sea salt production area on Salt Island at the mouth of Machias Bay. He collected the salty ocean water and caused the water to evaporate, leaving behind the mineral-rich salts. These salts were used for preserving a wide variety of foods, especially the fish that were caught in large numbers in this region. I'd like to end this with a few more words from a letter that Reverend Lyon wrote to George Washington. Partway down through the letter, Reverend Lyon says, No ships of war are presently in the Bay of Fundy except the Martin, stationed at Annapolis. Nor have the King's troops taken much pains to fortify Halifax as yet. But as soon as they hear of the reduction of Quebec, they will immediately make themselves as strong as possible. If Annapolis and St. John's River are strongly fortified, the eastern part of this colony, as far as Penobscot, will be ruined. It is almost ruined already, and should Machias break up, which lies about 10 leagues from the boundary line of Nova Scotia, an infant and once flourishing country of upwards 100 miles extent will probably be deserted and become again a wilderness or prey to our enemies. Now the whole province of Nova Scotia may possibly be taken by surprise if proper secrecy can be observed. Nine-tenths of the inhabitants who amount to 12 to 14,000 souls, wish for nothing more and would join us instantly. A few pieces of cannon properly planted on a hill nearly opposite Halifax would soon demolish the town and navy yard and destroy or drive shipping away. 5,000 men would not be too many to ensure success. I am very respectfully your Excellency's most humble and obedient servant. And then it's interesting, there's a postscript at the bottom of the letter. Would not a rising sun with the inscription Juzo de Sergo appear well on the standard of some colony? He was recommending to George Washington that a rising sun with a Latin inscription be placed on a flag for one of the colonies. And there was some consideration that this eastern end of Massachusetts could end up being a 14th 
colony. So as you can see, Reverend Lyon played a critical role in the American Revolution, as well as the early American history.